Sounds like we're ready. <laughs> Good afternoon, my name is Frank Tuitt, and I am the Senior Advisor to the Chancellor and Provost on Diversity and Inclusion, and a Professor of Higher Education here at the University of Denver. Welcome. I want to send a heartfelt greeting to all of you who are joining us here at the University of Denver for the first time. Welcome. Let's give them a round of applause, too. <laughs> so I've been asked to do a few housekeeping items. Uh, so play, pay close attention here. In the unlikely event of emergency, you may exit this theater through the door you entered or any of the doors marked with an exit sign. As a courtesy to your fellow audience members and the panelists, please turn off your cell phones. It's also important that we remind you photos and recording of any kind is prohibited. <laughs> we have reserved time in our program today for questions. As you can see, there are two mics in the aisle there in the orchestra level. When instructed, and I will let you know. Please make your way to the microphones. Thank you and enjoy the dis discussion. Good afternoon. I said it's all right. Good afternoon. My name is Felicia George. I am a PhD student in the University of Denver Eilish School of Theology joint PhD program. That was a full mouth. <laughs> Thank you for joining us on this gloriously beautiful day for today's important conversation, cultural, spiritual, and democratic analytics, an interview on race, education, and democracy. I am honored to introduce two brilliant intellectuals who possess a passion for the future of education and democracy, concern for the common good, and who have made tremendous contributions as scholars and public intellectuals toward those ends. I remember being excited to meet Dr. Chop at a reception hosted to celebrate her arrival as our new chancellor. As a religious scholar in the making, for me, she represents the embodiment of faith and intellect, two concepts that some maintain are antithetical, but which I would argue are necessary for developing praxis for addressing local, national, and I dare say global problems we face today. Prior to joining us here at DU, Dr. Chop was president at Swarthmore College and Colgate University. She also served as provost and executive vice president for academic affairs at Emory University and as dean at Yale University. Dr. Chop is a widely published author and editor, including six books and more than 50 articles. In Saving Work, Feminist Practices of Theological Education, a work in which she focuses on how men and women utilize feminist theologies to make sense of their lives in the larger context of theological education is, I believe, the heart of Dr. Chop's leadership. It is a conviction that education constructs students for some particular purpose, but students should actively participate in their own construction, not indiscriminately accepting dominant social and cultural narratives, but recognizing their power to participate in the determination of cultural and institutional conditions. I also believe that this idea is reflected in DU Impact 2025, a strategic plan focused on the 21st century transformation of knowledge, the holistic education of students, 
and the university's engagement in local and global organizations and communities. And I also distinctly remember my introduction to Dr. Cornell West. It occurred as a second year Master of Divinity student at the Iliff School of Theology. I enrolled in an ethics class that was a comparative analysis of Dr. West's works with that of Reinhold Niebuhr, an American theologian of the 20th century. His rigorous and prophetic scholarship gifted me with two main themes that continue to influence my work and the way that I move in the world. The first is an unwavering belief that my Christian faith is about something more than private piety or otherworldly salvation, but demands that I engage in praxis that contribute to ameliorating social, economic, and political conditions that exclude, marginalize, or oppress any group of people. In his book, Prophesied Deliverance, an Afro-American Revolutionary Christianity, Dr. West asserts that the fundamental norm of prophetic Christianity is that every individual, regardless of class, country, caste, race, or sex, should have the opportunity to fulfill his or her potentialities. Dr. West is currently the professor of the practice of public philosophy at Harvard University and holds the title of Professor Emeritus at Princeton University. He has also taught at Union Theological Seminary, Yale, and the University of Paris. He has written 20 books and is best known for Race Matters, which we celebrate the 25th anniversary this year, Democracy Matters, and his memoir, Brother West, Living and Loving Out Loud. His most recent book, Black Prophetic Fire, offers an unflinching look at 19th century and 20th century African American leaders and their visionary legacies. Dr. West is a frequent guest on Bill Maher's show, C-SPAN, and Democracy Now!, and has appeared in more than 25 documentaries. He also made his film debut in The Matrix. <laughs> what I would argue is a... Hey, come on, give it up for Matrix. I would argue that is a deeply theological um, film. <laughs> Dr. West has also produced three spoken word albums. As is evident, Dr. West has a passion to communicate to a vast array of publics, to keep alive the memory, the legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King, a legacy of telling the truth and bearing witness to love and justice. Dr. Cornel West and Dr. Chop. So, um, let me just begin by thanking uh, soon to be Dr. George and, uh, of course, Dr. Frank Tewitt, who is our uh, guide Absolutely. in so many things at this university. And I also want to thank. All of you, I mean, we had to move the venue for this. Mm. Cornell, I don't remember 35 years ago the crowds being quite so big. Look, cool. Do you? I don't recall, but. Yeah, but here we are. Yeah. You don't recall. Don't that was a recall. long time ago. That's a long time ago. But that was a long yes, time ago. Yes, indeed. Anyway, indeed. We're, we're, help, we're really appreciative of you all being here uh, to talk about issues that concern us deeply, individually in this DU community in Denver, Colorado, and uh, in our country and world. So I'm going to ask Cornell some questions, and we'll go back and forth, and mm -hmm. then we're going to leave plenty of time for questions and comments from the audience. So first, I just do want to go back 35 years ago or so mm. and tell you all and remind Cornell about my first meeting with Cornell. I was a brand new faculty member at the University of Chicago. I was still a grad student. Mm. And uh, I was kind of the only woman. And there was one African American, Robert Franklin, our friend. Oh, yes. Right? And it was oh, two of us. And, yeah, and a sea of other people. And uh, we, <laughs> we kind of had trouble getting our voices heard. And so we came up with this plan to bring Cornell West to campus, to the Divinity mm. School, in those sacred halls. And uh, he gave this profound lecture, an amazing lecture. And of course, one of the fellows 
uh, one of the faculty thought that he put this young Turk in his place. And he took issue with Cornell West's interpretation of Hegel. And, you know, Robert and I were sitting there and we were, <laughs> and Cornell, he not only knew Hegel so much better than this guy, he cited the paragraph, the page, and then quoted the darn paragraph. <laughs> <laughs> it, it was. I, I knew you were going to be an intellectual uh, leader, but you're also a great moral leader in, in my life. So this weekend, I decided to declare it Cornell West weekend. Ooh. And, and I reread five of your books, my probably five personal favorites that have really uh, taught me a lot. And I began uh, actually with the one most important to my work now, and that's the American Evasion of Philosophy, because it is the recreation of how we think and act and combine those, how we tackle the big problems of the day and how we bring the whole person together. So, we just heard about DU's strategic plan, and, and it just struck me so profoundly as I read through that book um, that in this strategic plan, there's a whole lot of Cornell West. Mm. And, and I think that's, if you haven't read the book, do it's a, it's a wonderful book about the best of what America can be, creating a tradition of very diverse thinkers. You brought thinkers together that had never been brought before. But pragmatism isn't your only resource. As I read those books, I was thinking about how you almost channel the Greek and Stoic and Roman philosophers. I mean, you have this beautiful command of how to make them lot alive. And, you know, you proclaim, and you do proclaim, the African-American spiritual and theological tradition in this country, a tradition of both great intellectual thought, powerful existential commitments, and moral action. And then I just have to say, back to Hegel, you dance and weave among those modern thinkers like mm, nobody I've mm, ever seen. Mm, mm, it's okay. But there's a lot of sources, and I think about them as four rivers in what must be a very vast ocean of your brain and soul. But I wondered if you'd talk about how those, it, your reflections on those sources, how they've, how they've stood you so well. You kept adding to them, but but you've had that from the beginning, these four big conversation partners. So I'd love to hear you talk about those four. And also about a couple enduring commitments. Mm, well, those are very kind words. I want to just begin by saying I'm blessed to be here. I salute this institution. I certainly salute the captain of the ship, <laughs> my dear sister, Rebecca Chop. Give it up for, for yeah. Chancellor, <laughs> Chancellor Rebecca Chop. Uh, it's very important that we, we go back. I mean, one of the things, when we first met in Chicago, it was clear that we had some very deep similarities in terms of you coming out of working class Kansas. My sister was born in Topeka, Kansas. My father graduated from Washburn College, one of the few chocolate brothers, black brothers that come out of that vanilla and, place. And that is how they called them in Kansas, chocolate, right? Oh, it, that? Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, in fact, my do. brother was part of Brown v. Ford in 1954 with Sister Linda. Uh, so then we made it on to California, but it was just so nice to be able to come together with someone who had very similar kind of working class background. And then your own illustrious career at uh, Emory and Yale, and President of Colgate, President of Swarthmore, we were together there, mm -hmm. and now, now Chancellor. And uh, I want to salute each and every one of you for being here, and Brother Frank. And, Sister Wynn, what is she now? You say she is the vice, vice chancellor for, vice for chancellor. Uh, communications. Yes, absolutely, marketing. absolutely. Justin Cole is here, and Scott is here, and Jeffrey's here, and my dear brother, the beloved father, Gavin and Zoe. Raise your hand, no brother. Just raise your hand. Give it up for this brother right here. Give it up for this brother right here. Oh, indeed, indeed. But no, for me, uh, you know, life is short, though, Sister Rebecca, and I decided when I was seven years old that I'd made Jesus my choice, so I wanted to be a, a Jesus-loving, free black man to try to tell the truth, try to have some integrity, don't care about popularity, try to cut against the grain, always have a smile on my face, and be a jazz man in the life of the mind. You know? <laughs> now, you all produced Diane Rees coming out of Denver, and I see she said a high, high standard. I'll fall, I fall far short 
of the standard that she sets. Because for me, it's the artists and the musicians who set the highest standards. They're the ones who dig deep in the dark precincts of their own soul to transfigure their pain and suffering into a truth that you feel. You just don't think it, but you feel it. Listen to her voice. Listen to a Philip Bailey come out of Denver. Earth, wind, and fire. You feel it from his gut, but he's got to master his craft. Diana Reeves has to master her technique in order to do that. So for me, that's my tradition. I try to do it with words and with a pen, I'll fall short. But I am uh, unapologetically a, a, a black man who comes out of a tradition of a people who've been hated for 400 years, but still taught the world so much about how to love. very important, how to love truth. And the condition of truth is always to allow suffering to speak. How to love beauty. So given all the social misery, you still get a delicacy, like the voice of a David Ruffin, or Luther Vandross, or Gladys Knight, and we ain't even got to Aretha yet. You see? <laughs> now these are standards, and this is very important, because when you come to intellectual dialogue, you always recognize the standards are bigger than you. The subject matter is bigger than you. The suffering is more than your own individual suffering. If you're a jazz musician like Coltrane or Mary Lou Williams, you know you're a moment in a tradition. It ain't about you. It's about something bigger than you because something was in the place before you made your entree through your mama's womb. And once you hit the tomb, it's still going to be going on. So the question is, in that little short amount of time, what kind of calling do you have? What kind of vocation do you have? Now, unfortunately, we live in a market-driven society so that callings have been reduced to career. Vocation has been reduced to profession, you see. Greatness has been reduced to success. And joy is reduced to pleasure. You see, I don't want to be part of a culture that's a joyless quest for pleasure. The pleasure is insatiable, all the addictions that go along with it. But there's a joy that cuts so much deeper. And that's the joy you hear in the horn of a Lester Young. That's the joy you hear in the voice of Erica Badu. It's something that cuts deeper, that allows for a connection that endures. It's not just ephemeral. And this is very true for our young brothers and sisters of all colors of all colors, because you have grown up in the most commodified, marketized, commercialized culture in the history of the world. And you've been told to be human is to be titillated and stimulated and obsessed with being highly visible, obsessed with fame and celebrity status. Never confuse a market-driven celebrity with a spiritually informed exemplar. Qualitatively different. But it's hard to make the difference these days because we live in a culture of superficial spectacle. It's about image rather than substance. You see, that's one of the differences between Beyonce and Aretha. <laughs> Beyonce is the greatest entertainer of her day. I love Beyonce deeply and Jay-Z too. But she's part of a culture of superficial spectacles. You gotta look a certain way, shake a certain way. But all Aretha needs is just a microphone and a piano. And she gonna touch the depths of your soul in such a way that it's not just stimulation, it's empowerment. Now, I mean, Beyonce got her girls in formation. I don't wanna downplay it now. <laughs> and and, and I, I'm not putting her down. She's a great symbol of this particular historical moment. She's a genius, but Aretha is different because she cuts deeper. It's harder for young people to cut at the level of an Aretha or a Gladys Knight or Marion Williams or we can go on and on and on, all the great figures because they had access to spiritual resources that the market is eating up every day, devouring every day. We live in a moment of spiritual blackout and Trump is just a symbol. Don't become obsessed with him. He's just a gangster among others. 
but he's just a symbol. The spiritual blackout affects each and every one of us. And it is the eclipse of integrity, honesty, decency, and courage. And it becomes all about image, spectacle, getting over by any means, being successful by any means. And that is spiritual blackout. That's what it is. The great Abraham Joshua Heschel used to use that, that term in the 1960s. As he said it with tears in his eyes coming from the old world to the new world and looking at a marketized American culture and saying, my God, these folk have tremendous problems cultivating the capacity to love. They're like Hamlet, who didn't have the capacity to love, but he thought very deeply in his soliloquies. Shakespeare understood very deeply. We need to cultivate the capacity to love truth and beauty and goodness, and I am a Christian, a love of the holy, but with a prophetic twist because most of our churches commodify, marketize across the board. I'm glad I had a pastor, not a CEO running my church. That's Shiloh Baptist Church. Oh no, we had Reverend Willie P. Cook. He wasn't a CEO at all. He was a pastor. He loved his people. He went to the hospitals. He went to the schools. He had education. We, 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 the schools themselves were shot through with white supremacist curriculum. We learned about Frederick Douglass in vacation Bible school. We learned about Mary McLeod Bethune in vacation Bible school. That's what love is about, making sure that you're caring and nurturing other folk. And the love was rooted on the chocolate side of town, but it spilled over with our precious Latinos and vanilla folk and Jewish. Catholics and so forth. So it was a love that had R-O-O-T-S tied to R-O-U-T-E-S. If your love gets so rooted that it can't flow outside of your community, then you got spiritual blockage. You got moral blockage. You can't be consistent. You can't just love folk who look like you. You got to love folk who look like you so you learn how to love so that you can love everybody. Everybody. That's the tradition. That's who I am. So. And I'm still a gangster because as a Christian, <laughs> I was a gangster before I met Jesus and now I'm a redeemed sinner with gangster proclivities. <laughs> so don't think I'm... I'm lifting myself up. No, pray for me, God dang it. So, uh, so many ways to go here. So, <laughs> I'm sorry to go on so long. Okay. Now, but. No, 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 no. You, you just do your thing and I'll flow along. <laughs> no, um, but you know, we've got, a, we've got a, a lot of graduate students and faculty, and I see deans. Beautiful. And a lot Salute of our deans each and every here. one of them. Yeah. And, and undergrads, too. And, you know, so powerful about the spiritual analysis of, of this day um, and where the heart is. And, but, mm. but what do you say to all these students? Is it worth spending hours? I mean, is that part of the jazz? You gotta have that technique, right? You practice, practice, practice. So should they still be reading Hegel? Should they still be sure. reading you know, Kant, should they be reading Dewey? Should they be reading, reading Douglas? Should they be reading King and Malcolm? What just, where's the balance for a higher ed? I'm gonna ask you a couple questions about higher ed, but where's yeah. the balance? Because I, we're kind of a student first university. So give some advice. Absolutely. Well, one is that I take very seriously the anthem of black people. Lift every voice. It doesn't say lift every echo. It says lift every voice. Exactly, exactly. So I'm talking about the Negro National Anthem and the walls start talking. Hey. 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 We, we didn't plan that. No, the spirit moves in mysterious ways. Oh, yes, it does. Yes, it does. But I say this because this is a human thing. We all are shaped by families and communities that teach us to be echoes, to conform, 
defer. Don't think critically for yourself. You can't find your voice unless you are Socratic. Examine yourself, interrogate yourself, and answer the most terrifying question you ever have to wrestle with, which is, what does it mean to be human? What kind of person are you gonna be in your short trek from mama's womb to tomb? And only you can answer that question. That's why when you read a Plato or a Tony Morrison, you read a Shakespeare or a James Baldwin, you read a Tennessee Williams, or you listen to us, or go see a Stephen Sondheim musical the the theatrical act, or you listen to a Beethoven or a Theolonius Monk. The questions that they are raising can only be answered by you, because they're saying what Rilke says, change your life, examine who you are and your voice is like your fingerprint. There's only one like you. There'll never be in the history of the cosmos another you. And that's a beautiful thought, but that's a terrifying thought, you see. So you had to have courage to think critically, courage to learn how to love truth and goodness and beauty, courage to stand over against the crowd, the mob, courage not to defer to superficial popularity. And then most importantly, you never find your voice without bouncing off your struggle to find your voice with the great voices of the past. If you think you are learning how to sing and you never heard a Nat King Cole, and you don't know who Carmen McRae is, you might make a million dollars and sing out of tune and think you an artist, but don't fool yourself. Don't fool yourself. The standards are still there, even if the market is pushing it down. Same is true in terms of the work that you do, in science, and art, and religion, and so forth, and so on. That's why Amos, that's why Isaiah, in the, in, in the Hebrew scripture, for example, become indispensable. Same is true within the rich traditions of the East, Buddhism and Hinduism, and so forth, and so on. Uh, so I would say, my God, it's just a beautiful thing to be at a place like University of Denver where you're able to struggle to find your voice and to undergo the deepest form of what the Greeks call paideia, P-A-I-D-E-I-A. -E that's deep education, that's not cheap schooling. You don't come to University of Denver just to be schooled. You come to be educated. To be schooled is to gain access to a skill. To be educated is to be so unsettled and unnerved that you have to raise questions about who you are as a human being, you see. And that's the beautiful thing about this institution because you got a lot of people who parents may not have had the opportunity. Now, of course, you don't need to go to college in order to be highly educated. James Baldwin never went to college, but two colleges went through him. <laughs> so don't think that because you got your degree, somehow you kind of high and mighty and more sophisticated. Now, no, you got to prove yourself. Miles Davis dropped out of Juilliard in order to teach some Juilliard professors how to blow the horn. <laughs> it's true. And I'm not saying don't graduate for students. <laughs> don't get me wrong now. No, 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 I'm not saying that. I'm just saying no matter how learned you are, there's still elements of ignorance in your learnedness. No matter how sophisticated you are, there's still elements of provincialism in your learning. We're just talking about the provincialism of Harvard, Yale, and Princeton. Right. These are magnificent places to go, but they still create silos and bubbles that, that generate blind spots. Every institution, every person, every tradition has blind spots. You can't stay in contact with the humanity of trans folk. Check yourself. You're dishonoring and demeaning gay brothers and lesbian sisters and bias. Check yourself. Can't stand conservative folk because you so liberal. Check yourself. Can't stand liberals, you so conservative. Check yourself. You can learn from a variety of different voices. Just be true to yourself, which means when you come down, it's going to be a unique spot just for you, just like when you came out of your mama's womb, there was a special little space for you. Floop, there it is. <laughs> 
Look at that little precious something, something, something. What you going to do in your life? How you going to find your voice? Meet me in Denver. <laughs> wow, we just get him on the admissions tour. Of it. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, you know, I love that. Courage to be, right? Paul Tillich, one of the Paul great Tillich, one of the great ones. We were born on, we were raised on that. That's Absolutely. great. You got to have that courage. Absolutely. To look. So um, you mentioned Paideia, and I did want to talk about liberal yes. arts. Downstairs, oh, we were yes. talking about higher ed, and you know, higher ed to me is about, it's the engine that fuels that democracy. That's true. <laughs> it is the engine that creates that knowledge, that creates new knowers, that creates the next generation of, of Cornell West. So I had kind of two questions. You can take one, or you blend them together, or you just go mm. do your jazz thing with all, <laughs> with all the, the great thinkers in this. But you know, I'm going to talk in a minute about you and Robbie coming to Swarthmore, but, but mm -hmm. one of the things I remember about that event, there were lots to remember about that event, but one was your eloquence on the liberal arts. So, you know, the conversation about liberal arts in this country has been, you know, defend the liberal arts, you know, or get rid of the arts. We don't need it. We just need technical training. But when I heard you talk about the liberal arts, mm. I saw that issue of the transformation, the contradiction and the transformation that you like to say so often. So oh, yeah. I'd, I'd love to hear you just talk a little bit about how you think deeply about the liberal arts and higher ed in general, professional, PhD, all the types of education in this country. Where's our future? What do we need to model? What do we need to embrace? Mm -hmm. I think here we could begin with probably the greatest public philosopher in the history of the American empire, and that's John Dewey, coming out of Vermont. He argued that paideia at its deepest level, deep education, the transformation of individuals from conformists to those who are willing to think for themselves and connect with something bigger than themselves. That, that, that's paideia is a very precondition for any democracy. The public and its problems, it's a classic of 1916, and he wrote Democracy and Education. He says, show me a democracy, he says, where the citizens are unwilling to undergo paideia and I will show you a democracy on the way to authoritarian rule. Very timely. This is Dewey in 1916. The boys and souls of black folk. He like me. He comes out of a people who was against the law for black people to learn how to read and write in the land of liberty, USA. And after Civil War, 4% of black people could read, most of them so-called free Negroes. Within one generation, it was up to 80-some percent. So that the quest for freedom went hand in hand with the quest for literacy, went hand in hand with the quest for education. You see, a hunger and a thirst you see, to understand oneself, understand the world, and so forth and so on. Uh, so that when we're talking about education, we're really talking about one of the most fundamental issues that serves as the benchmark for the future of democracy. Mm -hmm. Most of human history is the history of unaccountable elites, kings and queens and monarchs and suzerains, who dictated the destiny of a society. <coughs> Democracies are very rare in the long history of our species. Very rare. Plato made the argument with tremendous power in the Republic. What did he say? He said, no democracy will survive that long because most persons are driven by unruly passion and ubiquitous ignorance. They'll be willing to defer to charismatic individuals because those such persons will not think for themselves. So here come these Democrats, small D, we're not talking about the Democratic Party, we're talking about Democrats, small D. <laughs> here come the Democrats looking at human history and saying, we can interrupt 
the cycle of dom domination. We can interrupt the cycles of oppression because the demos, those Sly Stone call everyday people, those James Cleveland call ordinary people, they have the capacity to think for themselves and therefore they can raise their voices to shape their own destiny. They don't need to defer to unaccountable elites. Now, of course, these days, we don't have monarchs, we got oligarchs. See, we don't have monarchs, we have plutocrats. You got Wall Street and other folk. What kind of accountability do they have? When I was the age of young folk, these, when we were coming along in the 80s, the top 1% of the population had 21% of the wealth. Today, 1% of the population has 41% of the wealth. It's a massive transfer of wealth from poor and working people to the top 1%. That's what the Occupy movement was all about. That's what Martin Luther King Jr. gave his life for in 68 with the Poor People's Campaign. Thank God for William Barber trying to revive that rich tradition. Thank God for the spirit of Isla's School of Theology's own Benson Harding. Let us never, ever, ever forget the spirit of Vincent Hardy, because he's somebody who said, like Martin, like Fannie Lou Hamer, like Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel, like Edward Zaid, our great Palestinian intellectual, like so many others saying, we can interrupt history, we can create a rupture in history and sustain democratic projects. We don't have to defer to unaccountable elites. Education is one of the means by which people are empowered to do that. And it's not a matter of indoctrination. I mean, in, in, in any educational institution, you're gonna have a variety of different voices. There's no doubt about that. There will always be conservatives, always be liberals, always be centrists, always be leftists, and so forth and so on. And I'm a strong uh, defender of, of ensuring that people have a right to be wrong. Now, that doesn't mean I don't fight against them within the democratic procedures. They have a right to be wrong unless they engage in injurious harm to others. That's the civil libertarian stance. And I think that's very important. It's very important. Uh, so that in that way, you know, these educational institutions are very fragile. And it's one of the reasons why they're targeted by authoritarians of various sorts because they're so dangerous. They're so dangerous, absolutely. You get everyday people thinking critically on their own, the next thing you do, they'll say, maybe we know how to eliminate poverty. <laughs> poor people don't have to be poor. Maybe we ought to have high quality elementary and high schools for everybody, not just the well-to-do. Those are subversive notions. <laughs> They're good notions. <laughs> The noble notion. No, go right here. Okay, I'm gonna. I, I, they're they're just about to tell us to open it up, and I know lots of people want to make comments, but I have one final question. Sure. Um, so you came to Swarthmore six years ago, and uh, Swarthmore was having uh, a tum it was in a tumultuous period for us, um, and and Robbie George called on your behalf with Robbie, and wanted to know if they could come, if you two could come, you were willing to come, you know, I can't imagine these two call many places and volunteer, mm, but you were willing mm. to come, you wanted to talk about civil discourse and civility and engage the students and show how two people, radically different uh, positions on many intellectual and political positions, but deep, could be deep friends and could engage in conversation. Y'all did a beautiful job, and throughout your career, you've really emphasized um, talking truth in love, uh, civil discourse. There's a great story in Democracy Matters about Larry Summers calling you. It's one of the funnest stories in one of your books. Oh, yeah. He calls you in to kind of help bring down or discuss or criticize Paul Mansfield, the Harvey, the Harvey, yeah, 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 yeah. Harvey yeah. Mansfield, and yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, wow, and you said, no, you don't trash talk. And I was always moved by that story and moved by your career. And now I know many are really, are really concerned about the debate. Um, you had the interchange, what's going on now with uh, Tanasi Coates. And, and as I hear that debate and people on campus talk to, talk to me about it, I have to say, you know, I have kind of mixed minds. I mean, I'm all for civility, right? 
And it shouldn't cross bounds, but it doesn't have to be warm milk all the time, right? And also, I think for people like the two of us in the 70s and 80s, the first time I disagreed, or whenever I disagreed with a feminist in public, it made people really uncomfortable. Two black men disagreeing, having words even, really uncomfortable. But yet we saw, we saw the other colleagues taken after each other right and left. So, you know, this landscape for intellectuals, for, for, for people who haven't been represented in the center of the academy is a difficult one. And I certainly haven't figured it out. I am all for civility. We've got to be able to engage each other. But we've got to be able to do it with rigor and, and, and maybe sometimes really pushing and losing our personality, letting our person. But again, there's a line. Mm -hmm. so, mm -hmm. so I'd just love to hear you think about, yeah. not so much for me, this situation now, but just where and how are we going to get a landscape of civility that also allows us to disagree, disagree powerfully, and call each other to be accountable. Mm, mm. No, I appreciate, appreciate that question. No, uh, um, well, one is is that you know in the jazz tradition we have something called a jam session. When you come in a jam session, you get antagonistic cooperation. You got to be willing to raise your voice and be accountable, answerable, and responsible for that voice. And you only get better. There's no Coltrane without Gene Ammons. There's no Coltrane without Monk teaching him that there's high standards train. Find your voice. That's what Monk told him on the couch in Manhattan. And this is true for all of us, all of us. But what happens in the market culture is as soon as someone becomes successful, the aim is not any longer to make them accountable, but simply to affirm their success. So you become a lover of them. And if you're critical, you become a hater of them. So that conversation is reduced to competition, critique, is reduced to take down. I mean, I don't follow the internet too well, but people tell me all the time, how come you were taking down coats? I didn't take that Negro down, I criticized him. <laughs> He's a brilliant brother. His voice is important. I'm taking him seriously by making sure that the standards of the tradition from whence he comes are brought to bear. So Du Bois is saying, what are you talking about in terms of the American empire and drone strikes? We, don't, we saw that with Obama. Get a black president, you got to love him because he's successful. Absolutely, you love him because he's human, you love him because he's overcome unbelievable odds. Now once he's up there, what is he gonna do for poor people? What is he gonna do for working people? How, what is his relation to those drone strikes killing all of those folk in Yemen and Pakistan? What is his relation to Wall Street in terms of the 1%? These are critical questions. It's not a question of just loving the successful as opposed to rendering people critical. And people say the same, ought to be the same thing about each one of us. I love what Brother Coe said. Well, Brother West, I, I did say something about uh, uh, Barack Obama. You said I was uncritical. What did you say? Well, I said something about the speech you gave at Mohouse. Okay, that's a criticism, not a critique. <laughs> I, Obama was paternalistic in Mohouse. He looked down on those black brothers who already were highly successful in telling them somehow you got to be more responsible. They're already responsible. They're graduating, brother. But a critique is what is relation to how the system operates. What is relation to a foreign policy? I just had a wonderful debate with my dear brother, Alan Dershowitz. And me and brother Jeffrey were talking about this. I don't know whether Jeffrey's here, here or not. He said he's gonna be here somewhere. Uh, uh, and, the, uh, and we was wrestling with Israeli occupation. Oh, brother West, you come down hard on Israeli occupation. You must be anti-Semitic. No, I want accountability of elites in Israel in terms of treating Palestinians like human beings. <laughs> That doesn't make me anti-Semitic at all. 
But you ask a lot of folk, oh, they scared to say something critical because they're so worried about their career and think that somehow they be, I don't give a god dang about my career when it comes to telling the truth about poor folk. I wouldn't even have a career if it wasn't for poor folk who love me. I wouldn't even be up here without the love flowing from Shiloh Baptist Church and the chocolate side of Sacramento. And that is owing to poor Israelis dealing with increasing wealth inequality within Israel and then those in Gaza and so forth and so on, you see. So the question becomes then, how do we have dialogues that are full with passion? See, I'm not gonna apologize for being passionate about suffering and trying to eliminate suffering. Do I go too far? Sometimes I do, I gotta watch myself. <laughs> but I tell you one thing, I'd rather go too far in the name of trying to cast a limelight on folk who are catching hell and too many people don't give a damn about them. If I talk about trans too much, how come y'all always talk about trans? You strike me as straight, you missed the point. <laughs> you missed the point. The trans folk are my brothers and sisters. I talk about Jews in Soviet Union, anti-Jewish hatred, wrong, immoral. I'm gonna stand with those catching hell. That's what I learned in vacation Bible school. <laughs> okay, we got, we got to open it. We got to open it. I mean, like the worst part to interrupt. Definitely. But I got a lot of time, because we don't meet tonight until about seven. Okay, but oh, there you go. <laughs> uh, I, Allison can cancel. Let's give him a round of applause. Right. Just a reminder, we have two stations for asking questions, one to my right and one to the left. Please line up, I'll try to alternate. We'll start with the person over here to the left. Yes, sir. Uh, Dr. West, first I want to thank you for going to Standing Rock. Oh, I was in a Standing yes. Rock legal meeting yes. last night, <laughs> and people spoke about you, not because you were coming here, but because of what it meant to thousands of people and still does. So I want to thank you for that. I appreciate that, though, brother. We've Will you together. speak to the importance of American elders staying or becoming involved, especially white elders, instead of retiring? Mm. Well, you know, my brother, I hate to dictate any aspect of people's lives though, you know, I guess retirement is an option. <laughs> you know, I can understand, and if you, know, you reach a point where you feel as if you can no longer be the kind of force for good that you want to be, then fine, because again, on, on libertarian ground, people have a choice. But most importantly, you never want to stop caring. You never want to stop having some kind of commitment. You can have a commitment while you retire. You're writing, you're sending money, you're bringing in your grandkids, you're making sure they're exposed to certain things, you're making sure that your cousins and so forth. So you still are in some sense active even as a retired person. Uh, uh, but most importantly, we've got to shatter this spiritual uh, indifference. You know, the great Heschel used to say that indifference to evil is more evil than evil itself. And what we're seeing is a uh, escalation of indifference toward the vulnerable in this society. That's the makings of a neo-fascist regime. You scapegoat the most vulnerable. Oh, it's those Mexican brothers and sisters. They're the ones who's the cause of this so and so. You see, that's, 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 that's Trump's cowardly rhetoric, you see. Uh, and, and that becomes one example of other folk who are vulnerable, the women and so forth and so on. Black folk. So that retirement has its own kind of activism, possibly. But as you can imagine, I don't like to uh, generate in one model for anybody. I'm, I'm, I'm a pluralist all the way down. People have to choose, and whatever choices they make, they have to be accountable for. Them. But I don't like to dictate. If somebody's 70 years old and want to go off to some up in the mountains here in Colorado, God bless you and be with you. <laughs> I don't know what kind of life you lived before. <clears throat> Could have pushed it too much and want to, want to break. You know, I just don't know. But I appreciate it. Thank you. How you doing, Dr. West? Hey, um, how you doing, my brother? Good to see you. 
I read an article in Forbes magazine that said that by 2050, black and brown populations here in this country are due to be broke, that our net wealth will not be able to exceed our net debt. Those plutocrats that you mentioned beforehand are obviously responsible, the market forces and whatnot. And with wealth gap comes a safety gap. With a wealth gap comes the inability to raise future generations. Why am I fighting the same fight that my granddaddy fought as a Tuskegee Airman? My question to you is, at what point should black and brown folks in this country, for the sake of our safety, call the American experiment a failure? Mm. Well, and, and just let, let me, let me, I appreciate the question, but let me just ask you a question about it. Now, if we said, okay, it is a colossal failure when it comes to staying in contact with your rich humanity of the vast majority of black and brown, then what's the next step? What, what would be your, your response to that? Brother, you the wise man. I'm out here asking you. You know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> no, I'm here to learn from you. Submit. Like, you know what I'm saying? I'm here to learn from you too, my brother. But you see what I'm saying, though? Yeah. I mean, we live saying. in a global economy. You know, I traveled outside the country, got a little taste of Africa when I was there, and I was like, you know, this is not what they told me. It was when no starving children, Ebola, no nothing, you know? So I figured this is, a, this is more than what I've been told. Yes. So yes. I just, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm concerned that, you know, I'm thinking about being a dad, you know, sometime in the near future, and figuring out what is the most responsible thing to do. Can yeah. I continue to raise black children in a firing range called America? You yeah. see what I'm saying? This, oh, this, that's this what I'm asking. That's very, very, but you could imagine, my dear brother, what our grandmothers and grandfathers had to come to terms with. They under American Jim Crow. Jim Crow was not discrimination. That's deodorized discourse of some mainstream textbook. Jim Crow was American terrorism. Straight up. It was every two and a half days of some black body swinging from some tree. That's terrorism. So what did grandmom and granddaddy do? They said, we're going to keep this love train flowing. The Isaac brothers call it a caravan of love. We're going to keep this caravan of love going. We're going to keep it in the family. Come to the church. Come to shore to AME Church in Denver. And you watch this love flow take place against all this hatred and terror coming at. So we, we, so we, we learned something from those who came before. But that does not mean that the gravity of your question is not a real one. We just have to be mindful of it. There's some black people who live in denial. Yep. Everything's nice, because it's nice for me. No, you got cousins. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Might not be nice, bad for you, but look around. Yeah. And it shouldn't be just black folk. It should be brown folk. It should be white, it should yeah. be red, and the others, you see. Yeah. So the question becomes, what kind of courage do we have? The courage to be, the courage to love, in the midst of unbelievable barbarism, because that's what it is. You define barbarism in the biblical sense, massive indifference to vulnerable people, mm, yes, sir. no matter who they are. And that's what we're wrestling with now. So I appreciate your question. Though. Thank you, sir. Definitely. Uh, first of all, Dr. West, thank you for your encouraging words. They, they give me courage to say what I need to say. Yeah, uh, speaking yeah. about domestic ter terrorism and barbarism, I'm a third year student at the Denver uh, Law School here. Mm. And every day I park in the neighborhood and I walk to the campus and I walk by the ben Benjamin F. Stapleton Jr. tennis courts. Here in Denver, we've been having a conversation about Mr. Stapleton, who came to power at the rise of the Ku Klux Klan here in Colorado. He became the mayor with the support of the Ku Klux Klan. Um, he appointed Klan members to high positions, including the chief of police. And we're at a point where the entire neighborhood of Stapleton is talking about changing their name. Um, but I'm still walking every single day by this tennis court that has his name chiseled in the side as I'm walking by realizing what the Klan did here in Colorado to my ancestors um, of Spanish, Mexican, indigenous descent, and to Catholics. And I want to ask for your commitment Chancellor Chop, I know you're committed to inclusive excellence. I've seen your messaging. I really appreciate the work that you and the university are doing here to make it feel like a place that's safe for everybody to come to school. But whenever I walk by that every day, I don't feel like the values are reflected. It's, it's glaring in my face. So I'd ask for your... So I would like to ask for your personal commitment to do everything you can 
to remove or change the name that is on those tennis courts as soon as possible. So, so can I check that? So, uh, thank you for recognizing uh, my commitment. You know, it's a difficult thing. So those tennis courts are not named for Mr. Stapleton. They're named for a uh, child or grandchild. Someone will correct me on this, but they're not named for him. We looked at this very seriously when I first got here. So, you know, what should, but I mean, you know, boy, I had one parent that I sure wouldn't want to be held accountable for their actions. I have a grandparent that, you know, I think the man had some problems. <laughs> I bear one name, my name and my father. My father was a wonderful person. I've always been really thrilled with that. Mm -hmm. But how do you think about these intergenerational uh, issues? Because the tennis court's not named for him, but it was named for a later member of his family. I don't know. I mean, we've been struggling with that. Pardon? It's disappointing. It's disappointing because... If I may say something. Um, so, so the tennis courts are named after um, Stapleton Jr., which, according to your understanding, is the son, I would guess, of the mayor of Denver at the time. But the son of the mayor of Denver didn't get to his position without the privilege that he got through the political hijinks of his father. And if we believe about economic privilege that we teach, that about the racial privilege that we teach, about the challenges of people of color and people who come from impoverished backgrounds to actually break through to the middle class and to achieve what we call the American dream, we can't recognize his son without recognizing his father as well. And, you know, we can uh, reopen our investigation, Frank and I and others, and our deliberations on this. Um, I get it. I also get the, I mean, I'm a Christian like Cornell, and, you know, we have a lot of biblical adage about the sins of the fathers not being on the sins of their children or being on the necks of their children. But I, I hear you, and I hear the other comments that that sounds like an excuse, so it sounds to me like we're going to open this one up. Yeah. Okay? Thank you. Absolutely. Absolutely. Dr. West. Well, you could I'm, just I'm, put a big sign and say, we are fundamentally committed to anti-racism unlike this cat's daddy. Just <laughs> 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 put a big old sign up there. Huge. <laughs> just being clear, you know what I mean? That's just one way around, it seems like. But I'm... I'm <laughs> But I love that. But you know what I mean? Just being, being clear, because the history is the history, though. You know, there's no doubt about that. But there has to be a way of saying, in this particular historic moment, this is where we stand, and we're taking this stand, and it does contrast with what was before. And Stapleton, as gangster-like as he was, the daddy, he was the mayor for 20 years, right? Ku Klux Klan to the core? That's a gangster, <laughs> right? So you just call it that and say, but you know what? There are some anti-gangster voices. Then, all of Denver wasn't gangster. A lot of Denver was gangster. He won. Just like Trump right now. Gangster. <laughs> to the core. Oil, take it. Woman's private parts, grab it. That's gangster. But all of America is not gangster. All the white brothers and sisters not gangster. You got Heschel, you got Miles Horton, you got Ann Braden, and every black person knows a significant slice of folk on the vanilla side of town have some integrity. Now they got a lot of cousins. <laughs> we understand that. But we don't homogenize. People have their own choices they make and they're accountable to those choices. And you got a whole tradition of white brothers and sisters who went against white supremacy and made Thanksgiving dinner difficult for the family. <laughs> and you want to keep track of them, not 
valorize them and give them some moral prize because they thought black people were human and the rest of their family didn't, but they were decent human beings who were willing to take a risk. That's what we have to be in our lives in, in, the, in the light of ecological catastrophe, escalating nuclear catastrophe, economic catastrophe, spiritual catastrophe, all of these catastrophes that are coming at us simultaneously, connected to you know, the Stapletons of the past. And uh, there must have been some members of the Stapleton family who were against it, like the Rockefellers. You know, the Rockefellers had socialists, most of them were not. <laughs> but they had some socialists in there. When they gave some money, Laura Rockefeller, supporting the feminists, the Spelman family, founder of Spelman College, that's a Rockefeller family. We're cutting against the grain. We got to be concerned about the humanity of these groups, not just the groups in the abstract and the choices that they make. There was a Vanderbilt who was a communist. It's true. <laughs> I mean, he's lonely, he's lonely, you know. <laughs> Thanksgiving dinner, he's all by himself. He was a communist. He made a choice over against the grain of his dominant family. I'm sorry to go on and on. But no, it's okay. <laughs> but Brother Frank knows from our work at Harvard yeah. together. Oh, we had some good times at Harvard. Yes, we did. Same yes, dialogue did. going on, brother. Uh, just a little housekeeping. We have 15 minutes left for Q&A, so I'm going to close the lines at this point, and I can't promise that we'll get to everyone. We want to honor everyone's time tonight. Hi, Dr. West. I loved you in the Matrix, My dear sister, by the way. How you doing? So, so good to see you. So good to see you. So I, too, share your passion for students finding their voice and finding yourself in this world and using multiple resources and, and, and perspectives and, and ways of uh, creating that journey. And I'm very blessed to teach a course here at DU that explores these ideas of globalization and global citizenship Ooh, and cosmopolitanism. Wow but not every student has access to that knowledge. So um, my question to you is what would be your message to motivate and encourage more global conversations at all levels of education in, in every area of education? Because at some point this access to global knowledge, it becomes this issue of access if we're using it to create our own stories and to create our own journeys. Mm. First, I just want to salute the work that you do. Thank you. Definitely. <laughs> I think we're at a moment now, such deep desperation, where all of us would rather see sermons than hear them. I'm looking at you, I'm seeing an example. <laughs> and that's all we have to work with. We have exemplars, mm -hmm. exemplary movements, exemplary institutions, exemplary individuals. That's what the best of traditions are. And that's all we have in space and time at the horizontal level. So the question becomes, how do we cast a limelight on the exemplary movements, institutions, and individuals? You see. And oftentimes, all of those exemplary forms are still not enough. Mm -hmm. And you still end up with fascism. Mm -hmm. That's a possibility. America may, just may go fascist. <laughs> and Trump just first step. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Depends on what we do. Depends on how much coverage we have, what kind of cost we're willing to pay. America is not a magical place, as my dear brother Barack Obama put it. And I have great respect for Obama, just doesn't come through in some of the things I write. <laughs> he's a brilliant brother, but he's a brilliant face of the empire. I'm critical of the empire. Trump is a know-nothing white face of the empire. I'm critical of the empire. You see what I mean? But when he said America is a magical place, that's not true. Ain't nothing magical about this country at all. It's a settler colonial enterprise. It was a business before it was a government. Ask our indigenous brothers and sisters. The World War I began in 1492, still going on. But the fragile democratic practices that were created in our history by all of those, black, white, red, and yellow, was because exemplary persons generated some exemplary institutions that tried to safeguard some liberties and to ensure that the most vulnerable had some access to resources the ability to have some sense of dignity and so on. You see. And sometimes we lose, yeah. oftentimes we lose, but we fight because it's right. We fight because that's the way we want to be in the world and when the worms get our body, we say we went down swinging like Muhammad Ali and Ella <laughs> Fitzgerald. Yeah. Yeah. It don't mean a thing if it ain't got that swing. <laughs> and that swing is 
<laughs> intellectual, <laughs> spiritual, it's moral. You're on a battlefield, the blood-stained banner is there, the tear-soaked banner is there, you see what I mean? And that's what I see. And you, so as an individual dealing with these issues, you're, you're affecting persons that are very, very important. But no one of us are messiahs. No one of us are saviors. We can only do the best we can in the time that we have. Thank you for that. Thank you Thank so you. much. Mm -hmm. uh, first of all, I want to say it's a pleasure to be speaking with you. Um, Bless I'm you. Uh, 21 years old. I go to CU Denver. I'm a criminology uh, pre-major. And uh, I'm very interested in regards to the social injustices and social issues that we currently face. Uh, for my class, uh, I had to read a book called The New Jim Crow. Uh, it talked about um, the uh, issue of mass incarceration of minorities throughout the entire uh, country. So my question to you is, how do we solve a problem that is so widespread and so, I don't want to say ingrained, but yet so prominent in this country. How do we solve the issue of having, I believe an, I read an article that said in 2015, reported that 56% of inmates in Riker prison, for example, were African Americans. And that is just one minority. There's also 26% of Hispanics and on and on and on. And my question is, how can we solve a problem that is so prominent? Do we bring back a merit system uh, where an inmate has a quote-unquote debt that they have to pay to the wardens of which good behavior and uh, good works and their uh, job within the prison, when it's completed, they get award merits. And once they have enough merits, they can, even if they have a life sentence, they can leave the prison mm. and be a free man or woman. So do we allow these, uh, some prisoners who have committed crimes, and I'm talking about also people who have uh, committed crimes as serial killers, uh, who have been on the loose, um, and who have been on like a year-long killing sprees. Do we allow them a chance to get out of the prison system? Mm. No, brother, that question, we, you and I could have a seminar late into <laughs> next week. But I appreciate that question. It's a very important question. I'm glad you invoked Sister Michelle Alexander's great book. Yes. It, that's a classic. It is the secular Bible of one of the most important social movements that Angela Davis and a host of others have been trying to get us to attend to for a long time, which is this hyper-incarceration, especially among the vulnerable, especially on chocolate sides of town, and especially class-wise. Look at the massive criminality on Wall Street and how many Wall Street executives went to jail. <laughs> massive insider trading, market manipulation, fraudulent activity, predatory lending. Not one went to jail. I asked Brother Eric Holder that. I said, how come you didn't send your friends to jail? Because he's come out of Wall Street firm on the, as, as a lawyer. But all these brothers and sisters, Juan and Leticia and so forth, go to jail with a crack bat. That just shows how racist and classist the system is. So first you got to tell the truth. Michelle Alexander told the truth. She changed her mind. She was a liberal before she wrote the book, wasn't she? Yes. That's called paideia. She scrutinized herself and said, I thought this is a problem. No, this is a catastrophe. Yes, yes. See, America's never had a race problem. America's had catastrophes visited on black people, visited on brown people, visited on red people. Don't ne never confuse the catastrophic with the problematic. Yes, ain't no problem when people <laughs> catch in hell. The first thing you do is you eliminate the war against drugs. Eliminate it. <laughs> Most of them are for drugs. Second thing you do, you look at the restorative movement that's taking place in law schools and so forth. Restorative judge, uh, justice. How do you transform these places for rehabilitation and education? Now granted, there's going to be some gangsters there who've done some vicious things, rape and murder and so forth and so on. They are a, a, a class of hu human beings, still made in the image of God, who are very different than the nonviolent offenders. 
Now, the, the gangsters who have engaged in massive rape and violation and murder and so forth, they can still be changed. We know that. There was a gangster named Malcolm Little who was loved by Elijah Muhammad, who became the greatest prophetic voice against the American empire named Malcolm X. But it was Elijah's love that turned him around. It transformed, then he outgrew Elijah, but that's another story. You see what I mean? But that love changed him, because that's what breaks the back of love. Love has that kind of capacity. So what, what we need is first to cast a limelight. That's what Michelle Alexander, Angela Davis, and others have done. And we should note, again, the degree to which, and this is where I'm, I, 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 I always accent, black elite and black middle class indifference to black poor people being tied into that mass incarceration. Everybody knows if the black youth who were going to jail, going to prison, were members of Jack and Jill, and not on the corner, we'd have different kind of black leadership. Because what happened was the black middle class became intoxicated with the felicities of bourgeois existence. They became so obsessed with success that they turned their back on their precious poor and working class brothers and sisters so that they just looked up. I've been teaching in prison for 37 years now and I started with 180,000, now there's two and a half million. That didn't just happen overnight. The black elite turned their backs along with the other elites. And we have to take some responsibility as black bourgeois folk and say, you know what? Our love for Juan and Letitia and Jamal ought to be exactly the same as our love for these upper middle class Negroes who were doing very well financially, but oftentimes are walking around with an indifference toward their vulnerable fellow black human beings. And that's not a trash for the black middle class. But it is an accountability, same thing. The account, that's what we love about Martin. Petty bourgeois Negro preacher who loved Negroes in the pool hall the same way he loved the Negroes in the boule. That's consistency. Then he loved Vietnamese babies the same way he loved black babies. He learned that in vacation Bible school too. <laughs> Ebenezer Baptist Church. Yes, he did. We love Martin for that. We got the celebration. When our brother's going to be giving a speech, right? On Friday, my brother. No, on Monday. Monday. Yeah, you got the march? Maybe we should make an announcement for that march. <laughs> so I just uh, made it, huh? You just made it. Make sure you check out the parade on Monday. We have time for one last question, unfortunately. Lord, Lord, Lord. Yate, Dr. Cornell West, Chair Land Sosian Chair. I just read really you in my Navajo language. Um, my name is Lance Sosi. I'm an alum from the University of Denver. I have a question. Um, in regards to voices rising up, um, in this democratic society, the first peoples of this continent are still not being heard. I'm sure that if we had the founding, the former founding members, Dennis Banks, Russell Means, John Trudell, on that similar stage, the auditorium would not be as full as it is now listening to their wise words. Why do you think there's a strong disconnect between the indigenous peoples of this land and the larger society? Do you believe it's our disconnect with the democratic society that was forced upon us? Do you think it's the Christianity and religious context of the Western civilized world that was forced on us? Do you think those two large components have a large disconnection between the society as a whole, and that is why we are not being heard? Yeah, I appreciate the question. Very crucial one. Very, very crucial one. I think part of the problem is, from my point of view, and you tell me what you think, is that most Americans believe the lie that U.S. slavery was America's original sin. All you need to do is just pick up any text, any newspaper, any magazine. Slavery was America's original sin. That's a lie. That was the second one. It was the white supremacist encounter that led toward the domination, the subordination, genocidal attack, the violation of precious indigenous peoples babies, men, and women, and the dispossession of their land. 
Now, when you look at it in that way, America looks more like an empire than it does primarily as a democratic experiment. We have to be able to think both at the same time. America has been a fragile democratic experiment, very difficult for any social experiment to sustain over time. But the backdrop was on somebody else's land and the expansion from 13 states to 50, and they call it manifest destiny now. No, that's imperial expansion. And then you get to the Philippines, then you get to Guam, then you get to Cuba, then you get to Hawaii, beyond the continent, but already there. You can pick up Bernard DeVoto's great book of 1952, The Course of Empire. White brother to the core, truth teller to the core. Mark Twain said the same thing. William James said the same thing. There have been persons who have tried to keep track of the humanity of indigenous peoples, but the dominant narrative has been one to focus on this original sin of slavery tied to US democracy rather than the preconditions of any of that, which was the attempt to reduce the precious humanity of indigenous peoples, the savages and so forth and so on. The John Wayne films and so on. No human beings out here in Colorado, just buffaloes and Indians. That's white supremacy to the core. And even black folk get in on it. I want to be a buffalo soldier to fight the indigenous peoples. No, you on the wrong side, Negro. <laughs> you see what I mean? Yeah. Dominant orientation. So how do you call that into question? Well, you got to love truth. Let's just tell the truth of what happened. And then how do you respond to that truth? Now, with black people, one last point to make, that we become central to the imagination of the country, fundamental to the self-understanding of American democracy. One, because of course we're very much a part of the economic system generating the wealth, right? That the, 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 the wealth net of slaves in 1850 was more than the railroads, the land, the canals put together. Then the Civil War, boom. So you can't say, God, oh, race is not central. Of course it is. But it's easy to talk about race in relation to black folk because the Civil War had to do with slavery, black folk. But morally, spiritually, if we're going to overcome the blackout, we ought to be just as concerned about our indigenous brothers and sisters. We ought to be just as concerned about the white workers mm -hmm. and the women mm -hmm. and the gays and lesbians and others. Mm -hmm. But the weight of black folk has been so heavy and then culturally speaking, you know, the whole culture has been Afro-Americanized mm -hmm. through the music. Yeah. And hip hop now just globalized the Afro-Americanization of youth all around the world. You see, Jay-Z is part of the nobility of the world because he's a genius, married to a genius. <laughs> <laughs> but he comes out of a tradition of a black people who have fundamentally disproportionately shaped the culture of American democracy in stark contrast to precious indigenous brothers and sisters who have been excluded. Does that make sense? Dr. West. Yes. Yeah. Uh, Sister Wynn is behind me saying we got to cut it. So well, the Vice Chancellor <laughs> said we got all of it. No, we yeah. got to yeah, have to. <laughs> so, uh, Chancellor Chop, Dr. West, I want to thank you both for being real gangsters for humanity. <laughs> 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 Lord, it was a blessing to be up here it with you. It was great. It was great. No, and I always no, love no, you. No, 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 we love you. Well, no, she does. And I'm forgetting. So, y'all stay strong. Stay strong. Stay strong here at the University of Denver.